Hello everyone, I wanted to show off the game that I've been working on for the last little while. This video is going to be in three distinct parts. I'm first going to demo the game, and then I will show how you can try to play the game yourself. And then I'll sort of go over some of the architecture and some of the more nitty gritty details of the decisions I made along the process. Uh, there will be YouTube chapters, so you feel free to skip around ahead and back and just take a look around. So. This game is called Diffusion and Basilisks. It is a text-based adventure game. So you write text in, you get text back out, and it is purely generated by AI on the fly. So when you write out this text here and you get back text, that's coming from a large language model. And then the images on the right are generated by stable diffusion and then pass through an ASCII filter. So everything is, is purely text-based. Uh, this was originally designed to be played on a tiny box, a machine learning computer that I own, but I've expanded it out so you can play with different endpoints and an experiment with the game even if you don't have a computer like that. So as you can see here, I've got a little bit of a test game going on. You're able to scroll up and down to take a look using the arrow keys and the page up, page down. And then I've got various different pages that show you aggregation. So I can take a look at the various locations that I have gone to in the past and see those. I can take a look at the characters that I've met that I have access to and where I last saw them. I can take a look at my inventory and see what's going on there. And I can take a look at the quests that I have access to. And so you can sort of get an overview of, of the game and what's going on there. Now, Let's go ahead and kick it off. So if I put in something like head back to the tavern, then it'll await the model response and then we get a snappy response. I'm currently using the OpenAI endpoint. And so we get good responses back and you can see that I've arrived back at the tavern. And so we can say to Juniper, hello, I'd like to collect my reward for slaying the wolves. And we can see what she says back. We can see I got a, a hundred gold coins. And if we actually take a look now in the inventory, we can see that I went from 50 up to 150 gold coins. And so we have a functioning inventory system with various items and stackable items. So the game revolves around this repository. If you have a tiny box, we got some simple instructions here. I'm going to assume you know how to follow all of this stuff and you you clone the server you run it and then you clone the game and you run it however if you don't have a tiny box and you're trying to play around with this uh, just a warning you will need at least a mediocre graphics card something with at least six gigabytes of eram and i'll show you and go step by step how to do this so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to come and we're going to click this copy url from the code here and we are going to head over and you git clone and paste it in. Now I already have a copy of the game, so I'm not going to clone it. But once you have that, we're going to head down and we have this four other users location. And this will explain how to set up the endpoints. So a quick note, you will need Python to do everything that I'm about to go through. I use Python 3.10.11 to do all of my stuff, so that's what I know works for me. And if you're not sure what version you have of Python installed, or if at all, you can type Python dash dash version and it will tell you here. And I'll have this link below. You just download the installer and run it. So you need to configure two different endpoints. We have the text one and the image one. So this will give you back the text responses for the game to work with. And then this will generate the images for the game. So to start off with the text endpoint, we are using an OpenAI style endpoint, and we will be basing around the endpoints.json configs. So in this configs folder within the repository you cloned, if you go into here, you can modify the configurations of the game. This is the one we're gonna be based on. You can copy this and modify it however you want, and this will control how the game works. We can see that in here we have in the text the OpenAI endpoint and which model we are using. And then for the image, which we'll go over later, we have there. 
Now we can add, if you are doing a different location, you can add in a different URL and have, for instance, an LM Studio locally hosted model, or if you wanted to use a different provider, this stuff gets fed into the OpenAI Python object constructor, and you can play around with this. I recommend just sticking to the OpenAI one if you're not sure what's going on. And with that, you'll need to come to platform.openai.com and you'll need to make an API key. Uh, just a disclaimer or a warning, a API keys are secrets, do not share them with others. And you will need to create a .env, I'm not going to open mine for obvious reasons, but you're going to make a .env file and you'll have to paste an OpenAI API key equals and you paste that thing here. If you're using something local like an LM Studio, you will have to put a line in here, but I believe you can just put that empty and it should work fine. One thing to note with the OpenAI endpoint is that you will need to put in a little bit of money uh, to get some API credits. Uh, you should just be able to put in five bucks and that should be enough for a pretty long time of playing the game. I was doing some testing and testing out the model. You can see I've done 52 requests with 68,000 total tokens and it's cost me one cent to, to play the game. So especially if you're not using the big models, it should not be that much and you should be able to get a lot of playtime out of this for a low amount of money. Once you have that done, we can go ahead and test it. So if in the repo you call python verify.py and then we say configs endpoints.json or where you want, you just pass in the actual config file and we say text, then we should get back in a second here a response from the model. It should say something like I am a teapot and that means that it's working. Now, if you had issues with importing certain things, then you'll need to pip install dash r requirements.txt, and this will install all of the dependencies that you need to, to run the game and to do that, and then just try to run this again and sort of work through any issues that you have. And once you got this going, then you should be ready to play the game from the text side of things. We come over to the image endpoint. This is a little bit more complicated uh, since we are going to be using the automatic 1111 uh, sort of web UI for stable diffusion. And this will let us generate images with some code that's really well optimized for running, especially on, on lower cards. So if you run this here, go outside of your folder, don't put it directly into the game folder, but call this somewhere else and you can clone this repository. If you're unsure about some of the stuff with the web UI, there's plenty of tutorials online. But once you have that cloned, you're going to have to download the models. So you'll want to download this model and put it into model slash stable diffusion. And if I bring this over to here, we can see on mine, I've got models and in stable diffusion, I've just got the file here. And then this other thing, we want to come into models. We want to create a folder called Laura like that. And we want to download this other model and place it into here like that. And these will be the two that we want. Now, when you come back to the web UI, this is going to be very important. You want to come into here and edit this file. And here in the command line arguments, we want to add this dash dash API. This will allow our game to talk to this server and generate images. Now, if you have uh, less than around 12 gigabytes of VRAM, which I actually have some more, so if you hit Control Shift Escape or right click Task Manager, you can check your GPU. And you can see that I've got 16 gigabytes of dedicated GPU memory, so that's that VRAM. If you have less than 12, then you want to add this dash dash medium VRAM, and if you're less than, I think, like six or eight, you'll want to go down to low VRAM. Uh, this will make it take longer to generate the images, but it will make it not take as much VRAM, which means you can run on cards that you couldn't before. Once we've got that going, you just double click it, it'll launch it. Hopefully you don't have any issues with it. And after some configuration and some setup, it should open up a window. So we should see that here in a second.
and here we go. So now we got the web UI. If you want to come to the top left, select the model, and then say something like this is a test image. Set the width to 768, set the height to 1024, and then we come down to LoRa, and we click this here, and we click Generate, back to Generations, and we should be seeing that the, whoops, the model is able to generate something. And then obviously we can put in here like a, looks like a green apple, pixel art. And we get ourselves a, a nicer image to test with. But this is sort of just making sure that everything's installed correctly. This isn't too important. And then coming back to the game repository, if we run now Python verify.py configs endpoints.json, and then we say image, this will now test that it has access to this image endpoint. And we can see that it's generating here an image. The verification script is waiting for it. And bam. So now if we take a look in the game folder and we look in temp, we should see now a generated .png. You should see a cat with a bagel. And this makes sure that your text endpoint is working. And once you have both of those verified, well, you should be ready to play the game. So we head back over here. It is python main.py. And then you pass it the configuration file, endpoints.json. And we go. Now, you might notice that the game isn't perfectly fit. I tweaked with the settings. You can hit control on the scroll wheel to make the, the text smaller and larger. And then if we head back into here with these endpoints.json, we can see that there's a few other options in here. So we have screen width and height. This is how many characters wide and tall it is. And then this ratio tells you the character height to width ratio. This is used for the images. So if we head into here into the test game, if the image is too narrow, then you want to increase this number and it'll make it wider. And if the image is too wide, you want to decrease this number and it'll make it a little taller and get the, the aspect ratio of the images correct. And that should be it. That should be all that you need to, to give it a try and play the game. Now let's go over some of the sort of architecture and some of the decisions I made along the way while making this game. Like I had mentioned in the intro, I originally built this for my tiny box, which is a machine learning computer. It has 64090s in it, and I designed a lot of these components around it. And on the right, you can see the NVIDIA SMI. While I'm running the game, currently it's generating some text. I am using Mistral 24B loaded across four of the cards. They already have a pre-allocated full KV cache for the uh, 32,000 token context window. And then one of the cards is running stable diffusion. So I've got that all loaded up on the other card. So what I'm going over here, a lot of this was engineered around running on the tiny box. And the APIs were a bit of an, an effort of thought, so everything's going to be tailored towards that. So we take a look here. This is the actual game save file. It's in a game.json file. And everything is event-based. So we've got these various events, you know, give player unique item, give player stackable items this is some of our initial creation. This is a append only database. So you can only add new events to the end. You can't go back and modify previous events. So everything stacks up. And what that means is if we look for something like quest, we can see that in this game, we have a start quest and we have an end quest event. And that means that I know since these are the only two quest based events, I know that the current state of the game when you load this up is that the player has no active quests 
because they started a quest and then they have an end quest event associated to that. And so that's how the game is sort of comprised and computed as you go along where you just walk down the chain of events and you can figure out where the player is located, what kind of items they have, what kind of NPCs are at the location, just based on, you know, what was the last move event and things like that. Now, a big reason for going around this is designing around the KV cache with the LLM. So quick overview that a KV cache is something that can cache various tokens and the computation surrounding them, meaning that if you feed an LLM the same input, when it goes to generate another token, it can use a cached version of the computation such that each next token is a lot less computation. You don't have to recompute the whole context window. But an important part about that is that if you go back and change one of the beginning tokens, you have to recompute the entire cache. It invalidates the cache. So a lot of this was designed, and that's why it is an append-only database. You can't go back and change the original events because then you would have to recompute the entire KV cache. Now, if we take a look here at this decisions.json, this is a log file that I put out during the game so that you can sort of see what's going on. And we can see that uh, this is the messages item that it actually sent to the LLM. Uh, now, in this example, this is one with the OpenAI endpoint, but it looks the exact same for whatever endpoint you're using if you're running it yourself on a tiny box. At the beginning, we have a, a nice system prompt that explains all of the events that the AI has access to. So we tell it, here's what you're allowed to call. You're allowed to create a location. You're allowed to move the player to a location. You're allowed to create an NPC, kill an NPC, move an NPC, and so on. And this is the events that the LLM has access to that it can actually modify your game state with. And so we describe this up front in the system prompt. And then as we go along, we have this user assistant bouncing back. These very first two are generated by the game automatically when you start it up. But then beyond these first two, this is when you're actually playing the game. So when I was doing the test game, I told the LLM to enter the local tavern and it responded back with creating a location with the tavern and with an auto move player to the location. So we automatically got moved to this new location that is the Iosla Tavern. And if you look down here, we keep seeing that user is all formatted the same with the player performed and putting in whatever the user put in. And then the assistant responds back. And then the only thing that's different is here at the very end, the last user one, we perform some aggregations just to help the LLM get a better understanding of what's going on. So we pre-compute what quests are active and everything like that. Now we, we do still have quest information actually within the game state uh, or various other things like inventory based system stuff. And some of these are also disabled, but we perform this aggregation and then we say, what did the player actually perform? Now what this means, if we take a look and uh, this here is on the left, we have the messages that got passed to the LLM. And on the right is the next messages from the next game state. So the one on the left produced an AI based event and then the user produced an event and then that generated this messages entry on the right hand side. And these are the diff between them. And if you can notice, they're exactly the same for the majority of it. So all of this can be maintained with the cache and only at the very end do we actually have a difference because we need to inject these new things and then you get the new aggregation location. And so there's a very small amount that actually needs to, you know, it's these are basically what gets generated within the cache. And then the player's response is at the very, very end. And so that, what that means is we can actually pre-fill our KV cache while the player is getting ready to respond. Because once this event has gone through and the LLM has responded, we know everything up until what the actual request from the player is and everything here that I'm highlighting can already get sort of pre-cached within our KV cache so that the only thing we have to process is the actual user response at the end and then whatever the LLM response is on top of that. And so I hope this was a nice little overview just to see sort of what's going on under the hood. Um, there's a lot of other little details here and there, but that's sort of the, the broad strokes about what's going on with the game and, and how it operates. So I hope you enjoyed the video and definitely make sure to give it a try and let me know what you think.